Hey guys, and welcome to this episode of Torquem Talk. Today we have Scott Allen, CEO of the Powerhouse Hydro Flask. Um, fascinating conversation, taking the things that he's learned in his life, all the failures, um, his humbleness on how he got to where he is today and how he's learned from all of that and how he continues to grow and go forward. A lot of things that you take away from this on how you end up leading your different companies, um, a lot of insight on uh, the importance of culture and how that really does build a business. Everybody has these fluffy words to it and everything like that, like, oh, culture is culture that. Scott is proof that it actually does mean something when it comes to building a business. So please enjoy that. This podcast is brought to you by Mazama Media. And this week only, my team of experts is going to be doing free Facebook audits and website audits to make your ads convert. Check the link in the description to learn more. And without further ado, enjoy this wide ranging conversation with me and Scott Allen. I was actually talking to one of your, I had a, uh, uh, a, a very fun conversation filled, which typically doesn't happen anymore on airplanes, um, with a stranger next to you because mm-hmm. people just put on their bows and they yeah. tune out. But um, I ended up getting a conversation going with this uh, guy around my age sitting next to me. His name's Ren and he's a, a new product uh, designer, I believe, for you, or developer, not sure. But um, we were getting into... Um, a lot of different lines that you guys are doing and uh, he was talking about the mountain bike pack which I didn't even know yeah, about yeah. and so it sounds pretty cool so you guys are from what he was telling me and that's all my research I've done yeah. is <laughs> four hours guaranteed yeah and um, it, yeah he brought it yeah Let's check this thing out yeah, let me hand it to you so it's uh, it's got a whole bunch of different innovations and, and it's very similar to like a single wall bottle market mm-hmm. that didn't really innovate for decades right very functional gets the job done right so we have the same kind of observation that you ride here, especially in August, middle, you know, you go on an epic ride, you're sucking warm vinyl water at the end. And yeah. just what a bummer that is. So we really started to look at the hydration pack market and saying, can we do what we did to the bottle market? And so we came up with a couple of things. One, partnering with HydroPack, getting their insulated reservoir mm-hmm. inside. Most traditional kind of hydration pack companies look at that for a cold application, meaning you're in cold climate and you want to keep it from freezing. So it's insulated for that reason. We were the first to take it into the, it's hot out, keep your water cold, not it's cold out, keep it from freezing. Uh, the second thing that we did was put it in a neoprene sleeve with re- reflective, reflective foil on the inside. Yeah, and it's not that heavy too. When you first pass it over me, I thought this thing's gonna be a brick. It, it looks heavier than it is. Yeah. And, and the third thing we did is that airflow system. So getting it off your back. So right. the body heat, think about when you're riding and it's hot, you know, it's 100 degrees right there, that's gonna be coming off your back, not mm-hmm. more. So getting some air through there. And then the whole pack itself is waterproof and kind of airtight. So that's great if it's muddy and it's raining, you're not getting inside stuff uh, wet, but it also kind of minimizes the amount of air that's going through the through the system. So Ooh. what we end up with yeah, is, is if your traditional pack gives you two hours, this gives you four. And we, we kind of also factor in when we did a lot of product testing, people don't count the drive to the trailhead. So they fill with the ice water, they throw it in maybe the back of the truck with the Sure. So it's getting sun, but then they think about, okay, I put it on the trailhead. How long is it keeping water cold? It's already been working. So the reality is, you know, we envision people will find it's a bit more than what we state, um, but we'd rather keep the expectations modest. So you partnered with Hydro Flask to make this cool, uh, or Hydro, they, Hydro Pack. Hi, Hydro Pack, yeah, your Hydro Flask. But you partnered with them, and uh, that made this sweet bladder. Um, and then you guys just are you, then you guys went to town all around it. Yeah, yeah. For that. We said that's a starting point. So I can see this is kind of like the Columbia type of uh, like the Omni Heat, the Omni yeah. Heat design that proved to work. Yeah, uh, incredibly well, and then just this neoprene is just this is totally different. Yeah, nice uh, than coated, anything on the market. Technical fabric, and then that whole suspension system, how it keeps it off your back. So those four things work really well together to give that you know. And then I'm noticing four hours cold experience. I'm noticing some little things on this, like um, being a mountain biker myself. I'm seeing like. One thing that popped out to me was I like first this magnetic thing, but then it looks like you guys took another step. So making this adjustable. Yes. That's the little things, but that yes. can be annoying when you're riding and if it's not set in the exact right place, yes. it doesn't f- go right back to where yeah. it needs to be. Yeah. Or if you decide you don't like 
where that is to be. You like your straw to be a little up or a little down. Yep. So um, I'm a big fan of that. I so I'm curious. Um, how does how do you guys figure out that mountain bikers are going to want this? Well, I think the great thing about Hydroflask, and especially being a Bend company, is we we you know we look at ourselves. <clears throat> Not to say we're we're just you know the only people in the market, but we we know that these work really well because we go out in the middle of the summertime or we leave them in our car. They keep walking. Sure. Forward. And so there's a lot of uh, employees at that mountain bike. There's a lot that stand up paddleboard or you know camp hike and, and stuff so do you, like that. Do you interview them then? Like I'm just my my main question is how do you? This is a huge investment, right? On R and D and then the launch, the marketing, everything all in is probably for you guys somewhere in the millions of you right on that or yeah probably not close to a million. all if you add everything all up from the development and planning and staffing and resources yeah you know, marketing launch things like that it, it's significant let's just say sure and so a lot of this gets into you know discussion around strategy and where does our brand go and and you know how do we continue to to be great and lead the category that we disruptive but also, yes, yeah, speaking quite a bit to consumers about the relationship with the brand, mm -hmm. the types of things that they value and what we, we bring into that, into their life. And then thinking about the different things that those consumers do and how can we come in and be a bigger part of their, their life and the different activities. So traditionally, the, the types of bottles we've done are more before and after mm -hmm. the sport, not necessarily in sport types of products. So this is one kind of our first foray into in sport hydration. Um, but yeah, we just we we saw it as hey, there's an opportunity for some some innovation here. Ties in really well with our brand in terms of that insulation credibility, and um, yeah, and also built upon some work we did with soft coolers. So getting familiar with soft goods, right. learning about sourcing, learning about how our our brand shows up outside of a bottle into soft goods it was kind of an evolution. So starting with soft coolers, and then this became the the thing we said, well, hey, this. There's, an opportunity here. Let's see what we can do. Right, and you guys are right off of a uh, big mountain bike trail network called Phil's Trailhead. Like mm -hmm. literally, your office is right there. You have awesome bike racks. I, just get, uh, I took a tour of it actually because they're uh, pitching us to go and move in on the new buildings over yes. there. So we might be uh, your direct neighbor soon. Um, not sure yet, uh, but you guys have that. You have a lot of your own market researches, as you were saying, your own team. That must be convenient. I'm curious, though, as a CEO since 2012, do you sign off on all new products before they launch? Yes. So, and I've become, so the company got acquired in 2016, so I became the global general manager of okay. the business. Now that there's a parent company, so I report to a divisional president who reports mm -hmm. to the CEO of the parent company. Uh, but for a lot of what we do, the, the role is largely the same. Yeah, we, we uh, especially as we get into different categories, so we have a great head of product, and he's got a great team below him, but a lot of it's around, you know, where do we see the brand in five years or three to five years, and then the product teams kind of come back and say, here's, here's how we see our categories evolving. Here's some of the new things that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. And we, we do look at the different markets and competition and get a, size for, a sense for how big the markets are which can always be a bit uh, misleading because when you come in and create a market, there is no market. You know, like smartphones, sure. before smartphones, there's no market there. Mm -hmm. So it didn't make sense to go do that. But if you can anticipate consumers and a need, then, you know, double all insulated bottle, not thermos for hot application, but, you know, hydroflask for cold application, there's a market for that. Well, like Henry Ford said, if he asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. Faster horse, right. Yeah, yeah. so it's, a, it's similar. And then there's other things where we can come into existing categories or do extensions off our bottles into you know, finally doing a mug, for example, or our version of the, the koozie, you know, mm -hmm. and the way that we would want to do it with color, with some different functionality than what's been done. So um, over the years that you've been signing off on products, have there been any where you're just like, I'm not really sure on this, and teams like, no, 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 we should, and you did, and it turned out to be a big success? Uh, probably not so much, and it's more of how I manage myself through that. I, mm -hmm. I got some advice earlier in my career. So I worked for a person that had been a general manager at GE, and this is in the heyday of GE, not recently, where they really had struggled, but they were they were known for creating some of the the best CEOs in the world, just mm -hmm. the training they went through. And so this person came out of their more industrial business, but he, he ran the appliance business for a while. And he said his team came to him with the idea of the microwave oven above the 
cooktop. Got it. You know, and he's just like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> Who would ever want that? Like, no. And it says team overrode him. And when I'd be a wild success, he's like, oh, when you're talking about consumer, you're data point one. You are one consumer. Mm-hmm. Who knows if you represent the market or not? Sure. You know, so it's probably more about do we do our homework? Do we ask the right questions? Do we do we uh, go to kind of our core audience and, and and get that data? Do we look at the market? So I feel that if the process is is followed, uh, then we're pretty we're in a good shape. Then when I get, start to test some of the product, I'll have feedback. Hey, this didn't feel right. You know, this would be mm-hmm. something. Well, make sure this is adjustable. I didn't like it like this. You'd want to give them like even what you picked up on. Where does that magnet sit? Sure. So you know, I like it on the cross strap, not on the down strap. Mm-hmm. So that's where I just know it's there you know, right. if I have it. So things like that. I think a good good product managers and category directors take that input and they have to synthesize all that input. Mm-hmm. You know, you carry the title, so they listen for sure. But uh, I think they have to make that against the bigger. The bigger consumer base to make the call. So um, developing and well, I, I guess really at the end, what I'm curious on is Scott. How did you get to be like? How did you get to be where you are today? What yeah. was your like summarized life story of like stepping stones to being the CEO of Hydroflex? Yeah, I think there's two two answers. One is uh, repeated failures, and the second is kind of repeated failures. Success. I like that. Yeah. Excellent success, like too. Yeah, very so uh, humble about, of you. Let's talk about both of those. It <laughs> yeah. is kind of they kind of. It's interesting how it comes together. But you know, my whole background was in tech. So you know, Silicon Valley career. That's you know, you go into these startups and and you just you know, visions of grandeur. And that's all this amazing. Kind of stuff. And it's like, and now you're making hard. Now I'm here. Yeah. yeah. So that was the accidental success part. But the <laughs> the repeated failures. I was thinking about this and it reminded me of that movie that uh, Tom Cruise and Emily Blunt were in like eight or nine years ago, right. Edge of Tomorrow. Yeah. Where he keeps dying. It's a future. Great and he movie. goes off. He's like, oh, we got this. And he dies. And he mm-hmm. wakes up and he has to go repeat it over again. Mm-hmm. But he learned from that, okay, don't do this because you die. And then he gets a little bit further. He dies again. He goes, so that was like my career in Silicon Valley where there's, <laughs> there's you, you get the you know funding, got a team. This will be great. This will be great. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't turn out to be great. And you learn from that. And then there's the next one. And then the next one. And then you realize that for every, every Uber and every Airbnb, there's probably, you know, a thousand that go sideways or, or oh, fail. Yeah, yeah, the batting average is very, very different. So that was the repeated failure part. The accidental success was, you know, I'd moved to Bend for quality of life and, you know, raised my kids here and, you know, mm-hmm. mountain biking and Mount Bachelor, a lot more accessible than sure. going from Peninsula to, to Tahoe and just what was happening down there. So career was still down there. Uh, but I'd gotten to know the uh, group of people that had invested and the person that had bought out the two founders. Okay. at Hydro Flask and just through skiing and you know beers at Ten Barrel and these kind of things they asked me to come in first as a mentor potentially an advisor mm-hmm. and then before I could even meet the the founding team it was hey you know we're going to buy out the other co-founder would you come in and be CEO and so for someone whose whole career path and trajectory is you know the Silicon Valley tech thing here's a outdoor product so fan of outdoor products as a consumer, right. never built a brand before. Mm-hmm. Uh, so said no a few times because it seemed like some, Different. something crazy. Yeah, and uh, I don't know, after a couple iterations and the offer you can't refuse. And then the thought of, well, maybe I don't want to be on a plane every Monday morning to, you know. Oh, you were, picture, you were going to be flying here and back. I, I was well, I was living here, but my, my prior job, I had an office in San Jose. So oh. I was going down there, working remote when You're I You're used to that, to. Uh, getting up at 4 a.m. to get to oh, Redmond thing. Brutal. I'd get to the office in San Jose before the locals. Yeah. It's just that I look like crap. You know, they look pretty fresh. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'd been up for six hours. So, uh, yeah, so all of that was like, okay, maybe, you know, let's try a flyer. Sure. Let's try and see how this works out. And uh, it was one of the best moves. Let's talk about those. Uh, I, I love how you're talking about the edge of tomorrow reference of dying and coming back and learning a, something a bit better. And then as Tom Cruise goes, he gets a little further in the scene before <laughs> something kills him. So it's like you're getting a little further in business and then something kills you. What are some of the biggest like uh, things that you learn to not let that sort of thing, the, the robot kill you, so to speak, in business? Like, yeah. oh, I will not do these things yeah you know there's a couple one is just the people you work with and i think everything looks great when it's going well but you you start to see the warning signs when things you know the company gets challenged or or so you start to see who's kind of a team player and who's who's really quick to put daggers and other people you know around them to try to save themselves so 
I think that's part of it. The other is just really being honest about. So does that go into like culture a bit then? Would you it say? It does. I say leadership okay. and culture. You know, who's who's truly a team player and who's in it for themselves. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, you don't always know that until you you hit a little turbulence, and then you start to see who's who's there because they believe in the mission, they believe in the people. And so, what do you do when you see that that they're not there? Uh, Most time, it depends on who that is. <laughs> yeah, if it's your boss, <laughs> you go find the next one. Yeah, because you know it's not going to end well. Okay. Um, if it's you know, yeah. So if it's the people that report to you, then you need to trade them out. Got it. You know, or or get them to that place where they're they're realizing they need to be part of the team. You know, it's not about them. What do you say to the entrepreneurs out there that have a hard time doing that? Hard time holding their team or their people accountable? Um, I would say more of your first lesson of um, switching the people out, aka you know, getting rid of them sometimes Yeah. Um, because they're just not a good culture fit, but they, they feel bad. Yeah, no, it's so important. It's always the, 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 the paradox of, well, they close a lot of deals or, well, they're really good at getting stuff done. They just leave a trail of culture carnage behind them. Right. And, uh, or gosh, what if they're just a really, really nice person, but it's just not working. Yeah. It always is a relief when you go get rid of the person, Mm -hmm. you know, as much as you anguish over it and all of that. I think it just depends on the situation, but if it's a nice person that had great past contributions and they're no longer able to contribute at that level, there's not really a role for that person there mm-hmm. anymore, then they probably know that too. And so uh, a lot of times there's that kind of mutual sense of relief once that's confronted, you know, so you treat them humanely and all that. I kind found of that stuff. to be true too, but. It is a pain in the butt. Like yeah, sometimes kind of we outlast our well, we stay past our welcome yeah. or expiration date. Right. And it's not to it's not to diminish their past contributions or what have you. If that's if that's the case, uh, and then there's times where things are kind of a hybrid where the person's grown has a role, but the company's outgrown them, mm-hmm. and so you bring someone in over the top of them, and so they still have a role, but they're no longer reporting to the CEO, for example. So those are tough. Because there's those moments of build from within, hire from outside, what kind of company are we? But if mm-hmm. the business is scaling so fast, you know, I got two pieces of good advice from some advisors and board members of the past. And one is if you have someone that's kind of up and coming, but they're outgrowing, you know, the, the company's growing beyond, you're not really doing them a favor by setting them up to fail because the stakes start to get higher. And if they can't really perform that job or scale as fast, Mm -hmm. you know, the consequences are probably termination and a black mark on the resume, which is, you know, then the the thought is you did that. You set them up for that to some degree. You know, so you're trying to be nice. You're trying to put them in this place. And the other is if you find a really amazing person and say it's not the CEO's, you know, expertise of his operations or engineering, Mm -hmm. it's not the background of the CEO, you can't kind of do that coaching. Then you hire the rock star that you both learn from. So the CEO can learn from an amazing vice president of sure. whatever, and the up and coming, you know, future vice president can kind of get that career support as well. So there are ways to navigate these different situations, but um, they're they're tricky for you sure. You like hire them as a consultant. In this case, we you know we had one example at Hydroflask where we had a senior operations manager, and we really needed a VP of operations. I mean, the sourcing complexity, quality, number of factories, you know, our own uh, corporate responsibility requirements. Mm-hmm it was all leading towards we need to have boots on the ground, you know, in Asia. And who are we, this little company in Bend, to have an office in China? Like, how do we even do all this? Mm-hmm. So hiring someone that's kind of been there and done that was was an important step for us. And that at the same time, we promoted this senior manager to a director. So we could show that we were believing in this person's ability to, to rise up and go get a VP of operations that could fill the needs that the company had at that point in time. So what was the second... Um Tom Cruise not getting shot moment. So yeah, so the first really, one being people. And yeah. He, and now the, the second one was uh, really being honest about the value proposition. You know, you can have a pretty snazzy demo and a really neat little app and really mm-hmm. smart people and you can raise money, you know, off sure. of a, a vision sometimes. But, you know, there's so many things that customers can do, can buy, be it a business or be it a consumer. You know, mm-hmm. how do you become a just must have, not a nice to have? And I think a lot of times you fall into the trap of this is really cool and I've got a few people, but it's not really there's not really a market there. And you spend a lot of time trying to force fit something. Um, and so whether it's 
you know, just a compelling value proposition for a business. Like they just, you know, they, they need to do this to mm-hmm. be successful or for a consumer of just, you know, I'm going to go have these experiences like mountain bike. Uh, you know, this mountain bike isn't cutting it. Get on this mountain bike. Okay, this is going to elevate my experience. This is what I'm looking for. So something that becomes that, you know, must have either emotional connection or just that ROI logic type of, of buy criteria. If you're not there, you have to be really honest with that. So several that you're just kind of pushing a rock uphill the whole time. What does it take to become honest with something like that in the growth of a company? Well, I think some people are better than others. You know, you begin to look and see the good people leave um, mm-hmm. is usually a good indicator that you're, you know, it's not it's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, and there's there's just back to you know, are we attracting customers? Are they referring customers? Are they asking for more? Or are they being polite and they're mm-hmm. nodding a lot? But uh, at the end of the day, we're not. You know, we're having a hard time getting that sales to happen. Okay. And, you know, that, that requires a bit more more questions and probing. Yeah, you see it all the time with early stage uh, entrepreneurs that have ideas where investors are like, okay, you know, where's your traction? Where's your traction? Sounds interesting. I, you know, you're convinced I'm uncertain. Go prove to me that there's a market for this. So it's about getting that kind of traction. And, you know, the more the better, obviously. So what kind of culture do you believe in at uh, Hydro Flask? Or yeah. in general, I guess. That's a great question. Yeah. I, uh, one of my favorite topics. I believe, I believe in intentional culture. And uh, this was interesting because in the early days when I joined Hydro Flask, it was you know, already three years old or so, three and a half years old, we were having conversations with the board about this. And there was a couple of articles that got sent around and there was you know, a few websites, look at this, look what these people are doing. Because we hadn't really put anything there. And mm-hmm. I think the founder was so busy probably in the early, you know, get the traction, iterate, you know, uh, capital constraint, you know, just trying to make it happen. Never took the time to say, yeah, this is what we stand for. These are, these are the values. So intentional versus uh, what a lot of entrepreneurs might do if that just continued, which is, okay, we have a vision. Okay, we want to go be this big. We want to have this exit. We want to build these products. Mm -hmm. um, But nothing stated for culture. So intention is when you take the time maybe pull some of your best employees or think about, oh, this is one of our employees we're most proud of. Why? Well, these kind of things. Well, what, what's Right, the we did that too. We that? took, like, if we could clone two people yes. at the company, who would they be? And then our leadership team would be, okay, now why? And start writing yes. down their attributes. Yes. And then that's how we came up with our core values. Yes. Is, uh, by comp- like, we had a list of, like, 20 different things, so we didn't just pull integrity out of the air. Yes. We didn't just pull innovation out of the air. Yeah. They're actually things that embodied, like, our best yeah. people, and then how do we make that continue to flourish Absolutely. here? Not force something that's not here, like, oh, it'd be cool if we had integrity. Yeah, but do you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's, that's, that's where it's the, you know, it's on the wall and no one looks at it kind of thing. Right? Yeah. That's, that's where you got to be careful about and so for us, I'm we also kind of curious right now um, with. The, well, one thing I was saying to myself is that we have uh, eight. And I was thinking about like cutting that in half. Just because the new people that are coming on and everything like that, they don't remember all of them. Mitch, what are our eight core values? <laughs> See? <laughs> 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 so I think it might be easier with. Like it's, four or something yeah, like that. It's, yeah, it's it's uh, less is more ideology. It feels that way. We, you know, within Hydroflask and then our parent company too, I've been involved with some of their their work around values. Uh, you need to make them memorable, you know, especially for for new employees. And probably what's most important is that you just see them in action. Mm-hmm. But it's easier to explain to other people. So the parent company went from like nine. And I was part of a group that worked to get them down to to five, um, and then they put them in an acronym called I Rise. So you can remember that because yeah. it's like, okay, we're trying to you know, grow as individuals, trying to grow as a company, trying to grow as a culture. What can we, I rise, I rise above or we rise together. You know, we each I like that. Part. Yeah. yeah. So it became, and they each have meaning and some of those kind of consolidates, there's overlap. Mm-hmm. I think what we learned at Hydro Flask is um, it was, once we did the work to kind of put them up there, we all feel good about it. We said, okay, we don't want to fall in the trap of, we just put them up there and then we go be busy for three years and we all look at it and go, what was this stuff again? Yeah. Uh, so we started to, recognize each other on them so you know monthly newsletters and all hands we we Mm -hmm. recognize people uh and then we would hold ourselves accountable in our annual review to say here's how i think i did against these these four guiding principles from the hydro flask and the manager would weigh in on that so try to put that accountability yeah we put a plus or minus um that comes from uh 
entrepreneurial operating system. Traction, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and we, we go by that on the rating of it. But eight, I, I thought it was good. I thought we are on point, but um, I don't know. I think it's too many. And the things that happen then is when we, we stop and say, okay, how did the... Uh, how, how well are our guiding principles serving us in terms of the how we're using them? Mm-hmm. And sometimes that comes up from that is, okay, this one's become you know more confusing or these two seem like they're the same. Mm-hmm. So that leads to maybe small group discussions around, okay, like what, what you know, here's some of the underlying language. You know, is it clear enough? What are more examples? Do some of these kind of come together or, or not? So I think if you're constantly like scrutinizing them and saying, you know, do they, are they a mirror of us? Uh, and then that evolves over time. Every couple of years, something might, well, it's, this becomes as evolved to be really this is what we're trying to say. Mm-hmm. Um, so make sure it's constantly being worn and used, I guess, is the, the point that we found. What do you do when you get that feeling of uh, culture and morale is off? First thing I do is check to see if I'm the only one that's noticing it. You know, So we begin to discuss it. Mm-hmm. And um, so it depends on where, where it is. Sometimes it's, it's just change that's happening in the organization and maybe you know, isolated to certain areas. So, mm-hmm. for example, we went through a fairly large ERP migration um, in the past. And, boy, that was tough on people because you're asking them to do their regular job and learn a whole new system. And once you go live, it's like we're only speaking French. You know, done, we're done with English. You did a little bit of French. Sorry, yeah. you're so frustrated because you know what you need to do. You actually were good at what you did. Uh-huh. And now you're struggling, making mistakes, letting customers down, feeling like a failure. So, you know, that's kind of what people go through. So is it is it change related? Is it something around culture? Is it uh, an employee that we've hired that might be in a role or position that's fairly disruptive, that mm-hmm. they're not, you know, matching our values? We begin to talk about it, begin to isolate and kind of compare notes. But, yeah, a lot of times that intuition is really, really powerful. What do you think has been the biggest thing to raise morale and culture that, at Hydroflash specifically, that was done? Some specific success, thing. Success is a really great, uh, you know, catalyst, but that's mm-hmm. not the only thing. Obviously, I, I think it's really about demonstrating it from the top. Mm-hmm. I, I, you know, everyone, I, everyone's been at companies where they say it's important, but then I think everyone notices how it's woven in or not. And you know leadership behaviors, how they support it or or don't. So we've we've come up with a couple things that we do, and I, I learned this in the past of just you know the softball game between two divisions. I was doing an internship, business school, and there was all this you know working towards this and this big competition between these two divisions and then afterwards there's pizza and beer and just so much laughter and camaraderie and this this president pulled me aside he ran both of these these businesses and he goes this is stuff they don't teach in business school this Mm -hmm. is so important you know the people side and and you know looking at them as people not just assets on a a chart or like a machine that you're depreciating like you're trying to get the most out of but like (laughs) do do we care about the people i agree yeah and so for us at hydroflask we do a few things we we um you know, certainly our retreats are a lot of fun. You know, mm-hmm. we work hard in building a brand. So last year we went to Camp Tamarack, took it over. It was like Hydro Camp. You know, we had a band, we had games, we had competitions, we had moments around um, values and you know, better living our, our our values, which we see as a way of kind of reinforcing our brand from the inside out. Of course. Uh, and it was so much fun, and people let their hair down. You can just you know see people out of their normal functional you know, roles and responsibilities, which tend to lead to friction. You know, mm-hmm. why do these people put this demand on us? That doesn't seem fair. And then they all get out together, uh, either in that type of format or in like trail building or other kind of charitable work that we do. And they start to realize, hey, we have common interests. We have really good people here. So it's about kind of making sure those walls come down, that people are seen as people and uh, have a chance to connect outside of just their traditional business roles. Yeah, that's... Uh I, I fully agree with what you're saying. It's that human side. Um, when we do our outings, uh, I mean, we have a exercise that we do every year that people sign a waiver off of, but we repel off of Palina Falls. Yeah. It's like a 100-foot waterfall. We throw a rope yeah. down, and yeah. it's all safe and everything like that. It looks really cool. Great Facebook picture, but um, but it brings a lot of trust in, and you know, we do a camp out and everything like that, and people are just like, 
exhilarated from it and they let loose like you're saying yeah and then the company does like bond a lot um and then we consistently do like happy hours and outings um the one thing that i i noticed um when it came to health with culture was i was doing um, i would take like every uh team member out to lunch and i do basically like one a week one every other week and so it would take me around a year Mm -hmm. to get through it and when i would i'd be like okay we're going to talk about anything but business and that was good it wasn't bad i mean you know we i ended up learning a bit about who they were but then i flipped it around and i was just like um let's take i'm gonna take everyone out to eat and try to get this done in two weeks so breakfast lunch and dinner boom 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 gain a lot of weight i did gain a lot of weight (laughs) Um, but it was worth it. Um, basically, instead, the conversation is like, what do you want from this job? And then getting to know like what they're looking to do. And it's not all money related mm-hmm. at all. A lot of people are looking for different challenges. A lot are looking for uh, things like transparency, stuff I didn't know that was an issue uh, before, whether it's a transparency issue or a different issue with this person or that person and all the stuff that I was just like, okay, wow. And after that, it was just like humming and I'm able to basically take care of what everybody was addressing within reason Mm. um but god the culture uh morale jump that went on after that i'm looking to do that i i was joking with my team i was just like i can't do meals though every single one because it's just getting big so i think we're gonna do a lot of coffee yeah there you go you can just be jittery that's better (laughs) yeah um so what do you what do you think is your number one life hack if you had to think of it Probably just this ongoing curiosity and learning, right? It's it's what what were we good at as kids? You know, we just love to learn new things and be totally you know, open minded. Yeah, and a little bit less fearful. Like mm-hmm. okay, you know, you don't remember being three years old going, "I'm afraid I'm gonna look like an idiot trying this for the first time." You're more just like, "I want to try that." Yeah, you know, just that curiosity. Somewhere along the lines, like all that kind of ends. We become a bit full of ourselves or what have you. Um, you so gets old, sure. yeah, I think so. And just you know. The whole shame mechanism and all the things of like I'm supposed to be good at this stuff and I you know I don't want to go do that because I so just trying to keep some of that childhood mm-hmm. you know curiosity and, and excitement and open mindedness alive uh, which seems to be hard it's like resisting yeah I was gonna say how do you older. how do you do that when you, I mean you're you're you got the board of like Helen and Troy and stuff like that and you come in with a child mentality. I mean, my listeners would be like, wait, what do you mean by that? Yeah, it's it's within reason, you know, right. for sure. So we were more, you know, private equity and individual, more tech investor owned. Well, then you can have a certain level of that, you know, and because they like least viable product, manage risk, move quickly. Um, so that's kind of what, you know, you try something, okay, oh, well, the stove's hot, don't touch that. You know, you, mm-hmm. you kind of learn through, through kind of, micro failures you know fast iteration type of thing it's going back to the tom cruise thing allows yeah. you to figure you just try out to get that down edge to a small tomorrow. scale uh-huh. you know when you're a bigger company and it's publicly traded yeah now it's around um, not necessarily losing all of that right because the brand's evolving and there needs to be risk but yeah it's also realizing that the the stakes have changed a bit that there's there's a different formula and and finding that kind of balance does that ever scare you Finding the balance? No, well, just, uh, yeah, the, I guess finding the balance, but the idea that the stakes are bigger, so it lays you to be less like a kid. I think you, uh, you know, for us, it's, it's a couple of different things. One is just kind of eye on the prize is around, you know, the brand, the culture, the consumers, continue to service that. Mm-hmm. So if we do, do a good job with that, we always kind of felt like the rest will take care of itself. Uh, we do have to be mindful about, you know, then the stage of company, that's the second thing. So we're not a small eight person, 10 person, 12 person startup anymore. Right. So we're, we're bigger. We have to think about how do we do things. And I think this is where we get a lot of benefit from sister company, parent company, and just they've scaled brands. And yeah. we're not a small startup. We're, we're becoming a scale brand. So we outgrow a lot of things. So you learn that from your experience with, with growth companies that, you know, what got us to this level is not the same as to that level. So we're, we have to revisit some of the things and how we do it anyways. So you kind of put a lot of the context together and then you start to say, okay, you know, how do we continue to do what drives the real value in this business, both the consumer and employee side? And then again, be mindful of the rest, be mindful of the stage. The rest will take care of itself. Mm-hmm. And, you know, develop the good partnerships so the people you trust within your organization and in the parent company and sister company, uh, you know, they'll, they'll – 
speak up if they see something. That's what you want. You know, we're, we're on the same team. So, yeah, I guess the interesting thing on that is a lot of times innovation dies when you get to um, larger scale companies and it ends up killing them. But here you guys come along. Making, yeah. You know, you're, this is what it's built off of. And <laughs> yeah. So, so we gotta I'm, take I'm surprised by that. Yeah, I like the risk. I, I mean, I'm going to get one of these. I see what you guys are doing with it, and I see the innovation on it, and um, I want to have cold water. Yes. Um, especially in August when I'm sucking smoke in Ben because yeah. we just light on fire. Cold Warm water would be water nice. On top of your smoke inhalation? <laughs> not awesome. Yeah. Yeah, not awesome. Um, so, yeah, I guess what what's the main way that you guys are able to, like, punch into – I mean, when the cooler thing came out – I was just like, what? But you guys did it, and from what I hear, it's been selling, and then now this is coming out, and now I'm not like, what? Because you did the cooler thing. Um, you're keeping innovation alive, and and when it's, so, I mean, the cliche is that it's supposed to die at this stage. Yeah. You're supposed to just do this, Scott. Yeah, no, and this is, uh, well, there's just a ton of interesting things to talk about with that, because... You're right. Most of the times we push out there with something new, we, we fail. Mm -hmm. And so how we handle some of those failures is so important as leaders because you set the tone, kind of like parents with children. They go, oh, never do that again. So people are like, okay, I'm never going to take a risk again. So we talk about that. So <laughs> sure. it's like, you know, we have people within our organization in the product area that are like, you know, entrepreneurs. See what's possible. They go after it. They they get out there, and then we learn a lot. It's like, oh, that didn't really work to the way we thought it would. Mm -hmm. And so, how do we behave as leaders, and how do we how do we react to that it becomes really important because you set the tone. Like we can no longer take risks. Couldn't become one takeaway. We just like you know crush people for for things didn't go. Okay, so exactly how like so how do you like. handle um, a product? The people who are responsible for a product that failed. You obviously you don't want more products that fail. And obviously, you don't want innovation to die. So walk me through how you do that. Yeah, and so there's two, two elements there. I mean, if a product... And it's not to say we don't fail with these types of products. I mean, we, we're iterating, we're pushing the envelope. Sure. So, you know, what is failure? Failure could be, hey, we didn't get it out to market on in the timeline that we wanted. And we're making commitments to some of our channel partners around that. That could be a degree of failure. One could be, a, yeah, that design just didn't work at all. We had to, like, you know, go back to the drawing board. It could mm -hmm. be as we moved into new... Materials, you know, wow, we learned a lot in that process. It's not as easy to, to make it that way that we thought it would be, mm -hmm. and, you know, more delay. So, so much of it can be framed up a couple different ways. And one is, are we capturing that learning and, and leveraging that learning? Because if we go back to, you know, I think the, the beginnings of Hydro Flask was really around, you know, selling this type of concept at the Portland Saturday market, direct to consumer, if people didn't buy, that's going to be you know a data point that's important. Mm -hmm. People were buying, bringing friends back, and then color and different sizes, and so all that learning. And there are certainly things that we, we, uh, the company did in the early days that didn't scale, didn't work, as it started to become a brand and quality became really important. And you know, standing mm -hmm. behind our, our products with lifetime warranties and do, getting a lot of warranty claims on early early lids and so forth. It's like. That's not good. Because of like dishwasher, you say, don't put this in the dishwasher, and then they put it in the dishwasher, and then they want the lifetime warranty claim. No, it's more like things that would break. So our old old cap, especially the, the wide mouth one, had a little strap that you can carry right. on the side, but you open and close after a while, it gets stiff, brittle, and they break. Uh -huh. So, you know, in some of our mature markets, they just trim them off. There'd be paracord aftermarket handles. You could see that solutions were being made and what consumers needed. We weren't delivering that. We uh -huh. delivered the bottle. We delivered a lot of pieces. Uh, so we saw those things and we, we iterated. So, you know, it comes back to how do you handle some of the things that are disappointing or, or you know, failures. It's the learning. And then ideally in the, some of the learning, it's, okay, how do we move that upstream in our process? How, mm -hmm. do, we, how do bigger companies that are still relevant, relatively agile, you know, innovative. Mm -hmm. How would Porsche do this? How would Apple do this? I mean, there's plenty of mature scale companies that sure. can still blow people away with great product experiences. So we look at that. That becomes the, the thing for us. Uh, so yeah, not a simple answer because there's so many elements to, you know, managing it. And the other thing that we, we continue to learn is if we only have those big home run plays in the portfolio that are high risk, you know, mm -hmm. high beta stuff, that may not be awesome. 
because in the day, you know, our consumers want to see things that come out that are new. Mm-hmm. It's really around how do we have a portfolio of, of things that blend risk and, you know, ability to execute that, uh, that, that work for consumers, that work for, for our brand. Interesting. When my team uh, fails, I um, say I'm like, super stoked about that because now we know a way of how not to do something yes yeah, so you truck <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. like we, we now know that now. yeah yes, exactly yes. um but you continue to do that especially in our um in our industry of uh digital marketing which just changes uh, so often mm-hmm. to know that a certain product with a certain uh technology doesn't yield good results is actually a lot for uh how we do it amongst other clients so to be able to be like that one did not work as well now this one did because we were innovative and tried something that other people haven't there was no case studies on this there was no uh white papers was none of that but now there is because we went out there and tried it um so the degree of freedom um that i like them to have is very wide and uh, i get i don't want to know what would happen if i tried the rein that in i don't i think i have a lot of fun having this expire this fun like mad scientist over here yeah. and seeing this fun stuff that yeah. happens from it i think it's the the role of the leader is to to pattern that so if it's like this is not tolerable you're fired then everyone knows hey you don't take those kind of risks here we're gonna just play it safe yeah exactly that's the way that you you get ahead at, you yeah. know as in don't get fired right we're just gonna do a paperclip click campaign that's it yeah, because we know that let's kind do of works. What's, you know, tried and true, <laughs> sure. which you can see how this stuff happened, right? So as a small entrepreneurial company, and then they get bigger, and then the consequences are higher, and then you know the leader fires someone for a mistake, and then mm-hmm. that sends a signal like, let's stop innovating, right? Let's stop being doing things that are risky. So uh, I think the bigger risk is to stop doing things that are risky. I agree. For a brand or for a company. And so then you guys are able to launch this guy, the soft cooler, and even like, um, I'm curious on, so my brother bought one of these. Yep. And uh, we were done mountain biking, having a beer, and he had it in there, and he was raving about it. Um, thing that he liked about it compared to, uh, I don't know if I should mention this word, but Yetis <laughs> is, uh, <laughs> is Yeti. He didn't like theirs because they had a lid around the top. Yeah. And so he couldn't put um, a 16 ounce or like a bigger can. Right. Uh, right. So he often is in there with like a Block 15 and uh, the, the, the Crux makes a big can, I sure. think. And that's hanging in there. And he loves it because it keeps it cold. Yeah. And uh, obviously a normal beer fits in there nice yeah. and snug. No, it's smart. And we, you know, we're not always first. So we weren't the first water bottle on the market. But no. first to kind of come up with that insulation and color. No, my grandpa had a things. tin like that, but it didn't look that cool. Yeah, right? yeah. There's the old kind of thermos for the job site type right. of thing or hunting. <laughs> So when we looked at this whole experience, and there's certainly a big trend towards, because you know, Hydroflask did the first double wall vacuum insulated beer growler. It was before my time. So, so Travis Oh, yeah, that's right. I have that, one of those. Which made sense. Still, you know, yeah. Even the Shadow Deschutes Brewery and Ten Barrel and some mm-hmm. of the other the breweries here. So they did that. They're like, well, we can scale this up and, and sell that. So when we look at the, the, our beer roots go back quite a bit, but the movement towards cans is you know, undeniable. So just think about like, you know, at the river campsite and along the lines of what you said, there's there's different sizes now. One size doesn't fit all. So the, the approach that our team came up with was, you know, this comes off, put the can, put the bottle in, slide it down, locks it on, mm-hmm. you know, and it holds it up and it's pretty secure. I mean, mm-hmm. You're not going to be waving around anyway, but victory lap, I guess. I don't know. Uh, or you can also make it like, OK, we got we're down to last beer. Let's share it. OK, pour it in the cup. Here you go. I'll drink out of the bottle or right. the can. So it becomes... It's multi-purpose, yeah. the cooler cup. Mm-hmm. So yeah. what our team came up with. Yeah, getting a lot of great uh, reviews and accolades for something not necessarily a brand new category. But it also comes back to things that we, we learned. You asked about how do we come into you know, the, the hydration pack or this koozie market. The research we did with consumers as, as the brand began to really take hold was uh, they said, wow, yes, Hydroflask can and should go into some of these other areas of, of the market. Uh, and deliver value. However, it has to be consistent with the way I see the brand. Sure. You know, and the c- consumer saw the brand as not just doing Me Too stuff, not just doing what everyone else has, but finding a way to elevate that and looking for that opportunity. If it's, you know, hey, my pack is two hours cold, how about four hours cold? Have you considered making this pack like bright pink? 
We do have colors. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's that's the one we had to sit in the office. Oh, okay, so, okay. Uh, they do come in, in different colors, male, female oriented, just like Hydro Flask. Right, Not right. Not quite as many. Because once you were mentioning the brand, I just looked at this as black. I was like, I like it because yeah. it goes with like my mountain bike color scheme right now. Yeah. But I totally would see. I mean, the, the, the thing about mountain biking is now going back towards like an 80s retro yes. look, right? That's yes. becoming cool. Like bright colors, yes. bright blues, bright pink, stuff yeah. like that. That's coming back. Yeah, ski one piece too. It's a bachelor too this year. There's I've noticed. Good ones. Yeah, yeah I noticed. Do you know the big ski family of Chad Johnson? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. yeah, his, they're just wearing onesies that are bright yellow and bright pink. Yes. And like, you could point them out anywhere. It's like a great brand. I'm like, you are branding your family so yes. well, Chad, just having these people all flying yeah. around the mountain. You're oh, like, yep, hilarious. that's a big ski family. Yep. Yep. 12 people. Yep. Um, okay. So going back to a word I said that you didn't really like, um, Yeti competition. How do you use that to build, make you guys stronger? Yeah, we don't have a choice. I mean, they're such a formidable <laughs> competitor. And, yeah. uh, you know, they, they came across our radar pretty early. You know, they started a few years before Hydroflask did. They've had great They're making great coolers, success. though. They were. And yeah. so people would say, as we, we were getting uh, kind of early traction in the in the out, outdoor market, these people would say, oh, this is interesting. It's like, this is kind of like, um, you know, the Yeti of water bottles. And we said, no, no, they're like the Hydroflask coolers. So it would be kind of this insulation story and this elevated experience and what was i think brilliant about what both brands did is if you think about the hard cooler market before yeti came in and innovated it's the 15 pieces of crap thing yeah. at target that breaks or whatever and last get keep your eyes cold for an hour you know and, and they came in with these very expensive and, and you know well-engineered products that that consumers said yeah i would spend money for something that lasts, you know, I'm like your Patagonia, you know, I'm going to buy this, this sure. you know, technical fleece. It's not going to fall apart on me. I, I can have this forever. Mm-hmm. And so I think the same was true of Hydroflask. It's like, you know, this is an elevated experience. It's significantly more than an algae bottle. Mm-hmm. You know, three, three times the cost of a functional bottle just carries water. Consumer said, I'll buy this all day long. I want that elevated experience. So as we see Yeti uh, mature, yeah, we certainly, you know, you know look at what they do and we well, you got they, it right because they're coming in because they're coming into your industry right like they're making yeah they, uh, they they came into the bottle space probably three four years ago yeah pretty pretty aggressively and uh certainly done a good job broadening their their consumer base away from that not only that hook but and bullet. yeah they're, they're trying to come in like to your exact market yeah. What with Mount Bachelor and everything. Yeah. So it's got to be a little... Where are they based out of? They're based out of Austin, Texas. Yeah, you should go sponsor something down there. We've, we've done photo shoots <laughs> down there Good. and stuff like that. Yeah, I don't think there's a lot of love. I, I think, the, you know... Competitions product make teams us better, send though. send things to each other and the thing, stuff that's yeah. kind of fun. But that, that is the point. Yeah, you know? without them, you just be like, okay, we'll just keep it going. But like they keep you going and you keep them going. And we have to be better, better, better. And that's better for the consumer. And that's what why capitalism, that, one of the pros of capitalism. Yeah. There's cons, but it's one of the no, big I pros to it. that's exactly right. And it also gives us a bit of uh, you know confidence in that when I first came into Hydro Flask, we looked around at the existing brands that were you know, 30x our size. Mm-hmm. Right, so coming from Silicon Valley, you're small. You have an idea, that's just table stakes. I mean, you better go fast. You better be paranoid. You know, Facebook, Google, Apple, sure. Microsoft, they're gonna kill you. I mean, if you have anything really good, you better go get out as fast as you can and go scale this thing. So, we looked at you know the Camelbacks and the Stanleys and, and others and said those people, the minute they wake up, are gonna lock us out of the market. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, and that's it. We would be the, always the company that coulda, shoulda, woulda had something good, but couldn't execute. So that's who we had our eye on as that's the competition we should be interesting. concerned about. What was interesting is the way it played out, it was disruptors like Hydroflask that came in mm-hmm. and weren't from the prior generation of I'm thinking um, Swell product. right now. Swell was another disruptor. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't have a single wall bottle. It was 20 year old legacy that sold. Yeah. But all came in with a different kind of twist on premium, insulated, kind of, you know, outdoor or lifestyle oriented products. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. those are the brands that emerged, all disruptors, all relatively agile. Um, and sure, I mean, good, especially with the case of Yeti, good operators that we think make us better operators just mm-hmm. to you know, figure out how to deliver for that consumer. And at the end of the day, we see the Yeti brands different than the Hydroflask brand. The consumers will, will right, yeah, because you're you guys you cater towards um, 
me, I, I like to think. Um, and who am I? I'm the uh, outdoor enthusiast, but the outdoor enthusiast when it comes to I don't have a fishing pole or a gun on me. I'm not yeah. saying there's anything wrong with yeah. that, but that's just I have a mountain bike and skis with me. Um, where Yeti's really locked down the, they have a gun and fishing pole with the market, which is a huge market. Yeah, absolutely. You ever think about trying, because I know they're trying to penetrate my market. Are you trying to penetrate that fishing yeah, it's, market? It's, it's interesting because you get into like, what does the brand stand for and what is the brand, who's the brand serve? Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I think you're right. You're totally spot on because you're, you know, in an outdoor community and, and a, a more core outdoor consumer. And I think the core, you know, hook and bullet, hook and bullet consumer and the core outdoor consumer sees the brands very clearly for where they came from, what they are. There's a much bigger market that's just kind of general healthy lifestyle or, you know, the general population U.S. that may want to buy this because they look cool, their friends have them, mm-hmm. that don't know anything about these brands or aren't, you know, maybe in these types of, of towns or doing these types of activities. And I think that's the bigger market that, um, you know, they'll have to choose, not based off of I know, you know, I'm not hook and bullet, I'm more general outdoor. Mm -hmm. And they're going to buy based off of what they think the brand is. So if you follow kind of Yeti's evolution away from hook and bullet, that's it. For us, we know who our core audience is and get a sense of where they are around the world. And we're perfectly happy you know, servicing. Them really, it's a really huge well. audience. Yeah. So we don't need to reinvent ourselves as a, a something that, you know, hardcore hunting do is there so, so much crossover. It's kind of funny because, you know, industries come in and say, Oh, this is our consumer. No, this is our consumer. Yeah. No, no, they don't go, but you know, you go to natural food shows, you go to you know, yeah. outdoor retailer, you go to, you know, the snow sports now is kind of merged in, uh, action sports is its own different thing. But gosh, if we all moved to Hawaii, would we, wouldn't we serve? Yeah. Does that mean no, my you know, best friend, people and stuff like that? My best friend is a huge hunter, and uh, and it, it, he loves it, but he also mountain bikes, and he loves hydro flasks. That's what I mean. He also has crossover. a Yeti cooler. Yeah, that's the crossover. <laughs> I have a Yeti cooler, yeah. and I have a bunch of hydro flasks. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, there is crossover. I, I, I find it funny when people classify any person into this is just what they are. It's like, no, people have layers. They're like yeah. an onion. Like, like they could be – that's why people could be really into what – you're doing like who you are as a person, Scott, and like liking that you're with Hydroflask and to support that. But then if all of a sudden you decided to go open up a bakery downtown and you're leaving the Hydroflask game, you had a lot of people that cross over that like Hydroflask that also like cookies. Yes. Yeah. People, it's so funny how pe- <laughs> companies look at customers as so one dimensional, mm-hmm. right? There's only the relationship that's the only thing that matters in their in life. And uh, so many more things cross over, and I think the better brands really spend time trying to understand that. Yeah. And and maybe don't let it all go to their head and think that the only important thing that ever happened to that consumer. But, I, I, uh, I, better serving that consumer, staying focus on that consumer is, is yeah. really important. And yeah. And let the rest follow. We had an advisory board member uh, that was working with Hydroflask for about two or three years, and he was the founding president of Mountain, Mountain Hardware, and he had been at the North Face as VP of sales and marketing in the late 60s. So he wow. kind of grew up in the outdoor industry. Sure did. And Hydroflask was just starting to get, you know, strong legs in the the water bottle category. And, and you know, other competitors were just kind of in their category. And this, we're just disrupting our, our, our part of the market. And we talk about competition. He goes, oh, he goes, it's good. You don't want to be naive and have your head in the sand. However, if you're leading a category and you're driving a category, spend more time thinking about doing that. And let the competition react to what you're doing and how you're doing it. That's a way better place to be. I like trying that. To, trying to, well, they might do this, so let's second guess what they might try mm-hmm. to do. If you're the ones creating a category, just go do that. Go be great at that. Let the other guys deal with it. Yeah. Go worry about you and be great at what you do. Yeah. yeah. Do you find, I love that. Um, do you find yourself falling into that trap sometimes? You pull yourself out of it? Uh, or maybe you, you find yourself not doing that enough. And then yeah. part of it is just the maturity of the brand and uh, thinking about how do we balance, you know, so we still are the, the number one water bottle brand in sporting goods and outdoor, despite all the competitors that have come in to, mm-hmm. to both the incumbents that were there before us uh, and the people that have kind of come in with other products and other, other approaches. So uh, that's important for us not to turn our back on and say okay you know it's mature let's just ignore it we think we can drive that 
and we're not we're not done. Look at Vance. You know, look what they can do with basically a skate shoe decades later, still mm-hmm. be relevant and be wildly successful. However, we also know that with the outdoor accessory game, wow, there's places that we can move into. So for for us, it's about yeah balancing. How do we be how do we great at both? Accept some of the failures and setbacks, you know, even if they're you know we might amplify that internally. Hey, we had high expectations, didn't do this. Consumers love it, just mm. didn't meet some of our own projections, or vice versa. We didn't think much of this, it ran away. So just keep learning, and the process too becomes becomes part of it. And again, that focus on that consumer, you know, deliver great experiences, stay within our brand, take care of our people. You know, just kind of do the basics over and over again, and uh, the rest takes care of itself more, more often than not. Yeah. What What's the uh, Do you guys have some awesome next plans that you can share with us, or <laughs> maybe maybe probably it's, not for two reasons. Yeah. You know, like give the, the competition the playbook and uh, being publicly traded. But I, I'd say the things that we prepare for internally, just more, more growth, mm-hmm. more evolution, you know, as a, as a brand, certainly we've talked about some of the markets that we're going into. And, uh, just a couple of years ago, we, we had a vision that was around delivering this great kind of, what was it called? Own the delivery of awe experiences. So awe, that moment of like, ah, uh, stoked and refreshment and just like, what a great, you know, killer mountain bike ride, trailhead, mm-hmm. cold beer, like, Ah, that's our brand delivering that and uh, own that for kind of active consumers around the world kind of 24 7 like coming in their life much broader than the moments we were mm-hmm. so that gave us so much canvas to, to work with over time and it wasn't even 2016 i think we were like you know less than one percent outside the united states i mean canada not you know, we weren't even really much in canada so have a sense like cons- there was consumers that get outside that want these elevated experiences yeah. all over the world. Turns and out, we, yeah, yeah, and we <laughs> just did it. Yeah, you would think. Yeah, right? yeah. There's just all sorts of things around ice water, yeah. not ice water, and obviously we can't be completely thinking every, everywhere else exactly like this. Or there are certain cultural differences, but um, that's been fun for us is becoming more global and thinking about global consumers. And, uh, yeah, just more evolution, maturity. You know, you have to get smarter with process. We have to do all the things that bigger companies do, but without losing the fire of what makes a brand special. So we think we have the right kind of balance around these things. Um, can I ask you a personal question? Sure. Maybe. Okay. I'm on the camera. I'm on the screen. Yeah, right. Um, are you fulfilled? 100%. Why? Yeah, 100%. Why and how? Uh, you know, it's funny. It, it it's, it's almost like how expectations... Right? I don't know if you ever go to a movie people are like, oh, this is the best movie, this is the best movie, this but when you come out, like, eh, that was pretty good. <laughs> and then people <laughs> yeah. are like, oh, that movie really sucked. You're like, that was a really good movie. You know? mm-hmm. So part of it's just that, you know, the whole accidental success. You come into this flyer business, and my biggest fear is like, uh, I'm going to be bored. You know, I, I miss growth companies. I miss things in Silicon Valley. You get, it can scale. It can go like crazy. And uh, Hydroflash did that. It was mm-hmm. amazing. You didn't expect it to. And the things around... Um, you know, being bored, didn't have to worry about that. Things around learning, it's like, what does it take to build a great brand? Mm-hmm. I didn't know how to do that. And uh, so I surround myself with a lot of smart people that had done that. And man, I was curious and I love the learning of that. I love like why do consumers emotionally connect to a brand, one brand and not another? You know, I'm an engineer, undergrad with an MBA, it's like everything had to be logical for me. The consumer emotion and love for a brand I feel it too for certain brands, but mm-hmm. it's not logical. It's emotion. It's very complex. So how do you build a company around that? What a great learning and development and growth opportunity for, for me personally. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then being in Bend, Oregon, it's just, you get it, right? You see all the people moving here. And, I don't know uh, what you're talking about. This yeah, place don't is move awful. here. It's awful. It's awful. <laughs> uh, the volcano is right, about to just, erupt where are we brought like any day now. <laughs> There's dust in the trails. <laughs> yeah. It's smoky a lot. August is called fire month. But to uh, be part of this community, you know, from a, a as a as a business, as a I tell our leadership team, you know, we're a pillar of this community. Uh, respect that, mm-hmm. you know, honor that, uh, help live up to that. We have a lot of reasons to be grateful for the Bend community to help create Hydroflask. You know, how many people come up and say, "We got eighteen in our cabinet." I said, "You don't know the minimum is twenty two now." You know, you step it up. <laughs> and I said, "Yeah, but we gift a ton. We've been giving yeah. these away to everyone across the country as for, do for years." Yeah. It's a sign of bent in mm-hmm. their in their mind. So um, wow, I mean, you, 
going into it, no, it's not what any of us expected. I don't think the investors expected it to do, to, to scale and so forth as, as well as it did in those early years. And so, yeah, it's been it's been awesome. Yeah. Um, and plenty of opportunity to learn, grow, develop, and yeah, certainly as, as the years go by, it's funny. We're one of our offsites, all of our vice presidents and directors. I was like, well, we're talking about the 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 the, the good year, the easy year. And one of the guys at the product goes, uh, Scott, question? I go, yeah. He goes, which year exactly was the easy year? Because he remembered vividly all, you know, some, some of us kind of romanticized the past. He sure. was one that has a very factual yeah. mind. He's like, eh, it wasn't any good year. In, that. I mean, in terms of like an easy, relative sure. easy. You always look back and say, well, it's harder now. It wasn't that. He's like, no, every year was really difficult. Yeah, and the bigger and you get, the more the problems. Yeah. They're just different problems. But always kind of outgrowing things. Always mm-hmm. kind of, yeah, and learning, but... You know that didn't work. That didn't work. Okay, that broke. Okay, now mm-hmm. we got to fix that. So, um, yeah, just remembering some of that along the way. How about the? Uh, y- you know something I was kind of realizing the other day on why I love you guys um, a bit and the industry itself as a whole is its impact it has. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not a tree hugging hippie, but I do care a lot about the environment. And plastic water bottles are kind of. I don't see any point in them. Uh, they are a waste of material and water is, uh, it's not free, but it's a lot cheaper when you fill it from a tap, especially when you're, it's coming from good taps along the West coast. Uh, but even water in cities and everything, it's graded to be able to take water. And then the, 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 the like Aquafina and Dasani, where do you think that's coming from? It's coming from the tap anyway. Yeah. And so to see, um, across the West coast, across, uh, definitely Bend, Oregon, Portland, all these people of hydro flasks. People going to um, restaurants, uh, like when you're sitting in a Cafe Yum or uh, or Deschutes, it doesn't really matter, and they're filling up, well, maybe not Deschutes because they weigh any, but any of the ones where you kind of get your own forks and knives yeah. and everything, they're filling up their own hydro flasks yeah. with water, and um, that's taking also out the, uh, the need for cleaning glasses uh, multiple times, because what's the point of that, too, if somebody can bring their own cup? Um, Anyway, what I'm getting at is that do you feel like uh, environmentally proud of what Hydroflask is doing? It's uh, it's certainly part of it, mm-hmm. you know. And any reusable bottle will will do that. But uh, probably what gives us more more hope and optimism is just the fact that that is becoming a global phenomenon. And when you live in a place like Ben with pristine outdoor mm-hmm. recreation, and you become really sensitive to how do we preserve some of this. Um, yeah, and I think we saw it early in Hawaii where people adopt the brand and they're in the ocean. There's plastic floating in the ocean. Uh, and, you know, how, just pristine, beautiful outdoor environments to see it litter, to see, you know, a lot of this. And just you see the study that 80% doesn't make it to recycling. It's in mm-hmm. landfill. Uh, so, yeah, we feel good about that. There's certainly an ethos in the outdoor industry around reusability, quality, uh, seeing more of, I'm on the board of a company called Rumple and, you know, just post-consumer waste recycled bottle as ingredients for, for outdoor products mm-hmm. becomes really, really important as well. So we, we, we love that. We love the fact consumers are really latching on that. And we think it's even the younger generation, it's, it's you know, front and center. Campus is banning Dasani-type bottles yeah. on campus. Big mm-hmm. movements there. Um well, it's, 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 it's like, what's the point? And now when you go into airports anywhere in the U.S., you have those easy refill yes. stations, right? Yes. We have them in our office, too, and it's just great. Uh, it's just like, and it gets the idea of people, even if they weren't used to it, they're like, why? Okay, I'm right now refilling a plastic bottle I just used that I just bought for $3. Like, I keep on doing this. This is, is kind of ridiculous. Yes. Or they're not refilling it at all, and they're completely wasteful, and some people are just kind of lose hope. I get a little discouraged. I was just in Philly for business last week, and um, I was having that same kind of a, a cafe yum type of experience. Right. But there was just plastic everywhere. I was the only one in there that had my own bottle, and I was just like, "Okay, we got some work to do." We're, yeah. uh, you know, I'm kind of we're in this bubble over here on the West Coast, but um, at least we know we have areas improve and where to attack it. So um, you guys should do a Philly campaign. But what I wasn't going to get yeah. to though, as I digress there, is that. Here you are doing it in another area of waste. Yeah. Which is, is a smart area for business as well, keeping your coffee hot. Because if you go to Starbucks and you get, I mean, how long does your coffee stay hot, Net? Not very long. No. Yeah. And guess what? My girlfriend 
is huge on this kind of stuff. And she has a bunch of containers like these that she carries around. She has all sorts of these stuff. Hydro files, she has all sorts of stuff. She's like carrying them around like everywhere she goes. And she goes in any of these coffee, coffee shops and they are completely fine and smiles on their face when you hand over your own cup to fill it instead of using one of their paper cups. Right. So now you have, um, how long does that stay hot for? That one's like uh, six hours. So six hours of heat compared to... What forty five minutes? Yeah, if that. If I mean, that. Usually, our bigger complaint is consumers have to calibrate to the hydro flask. Where the first time they take a sip out of it, it's so coffee, hot. it's like, oh, that is really hot. Yeah, I, I did that. I mm-hmm. old Starbucks tumbler, get my hydro flask coffee. It's like, whoa, that's really hot. <laughs> Driving, like, if you really want to drink it, so you got to take the lid off to yeah. let the heat out. Because, mm-hmm. but that's what it's doing. But when you go up and do a cone lap in the morning. And at six o'clock, got a headlamp on. You want to come down and have piping hot coffee in your car. You do. Yeah. So it gives a consumer more of the ability, and uh, they can kind of tune it to whatever they want. Yeah, but as you start to, as consumers are able to see that they can start saying no to that paper and the plastic lid that goes with it, um, then you're saving resources for the shop, especially the local mom and pop ones, which they love. And obviously, it's good for the environment. And it's great for you guys as a business thing because you're supplying the cups. Yes. So it's all around like, hey, this is a great model that can help the planet and we can help grow a business and grow a great culture from it, which I think is fantastic. You see it with grocery stores or or places that say, okay, here's a little discount because you brought a bag. Mm -hmm. Here's a little discount you brought your own cup. Right. Back porch, I think, does that. So just incenting the right right behavior. And I I, I think what, what makes me, you know, hopeful about our society is people aren't doing it for that nickel off. They're doing it because they just feel it's the right thing to do. Right. And if more and more people do that, and, you know, the, right, the kind of healthy legislation, potentially, of banning some of the single-use things that are starting to see that around the world, uh, then, you know, through incentive and through kind of regulatory, consumers end up doing what should have been kind of the right thing from the beginning. So, yeah, does uh, Does Helen of Troy have lobbyists for Washington to ban plastic water bottles? Uh, not that I'm aware of. It'd be well, a we, smart move. I we, do have, we do have uh, so our, our VP of marketing e-commerce, Phyllis Grove, and she's got a great background. She was at Keen and Mountain Hardware before. She's on the Outdoor Industry Association board. Mm-hmm. And part of the responsibilities of the OIA board is to do a capital summit where you go to D.C. and you meet with legislation. And it's interesting because the outdoor industry is growing up as an industry. You talk about maturity and hydro flask. I think the industry is the same. Same way we... We were a force, like we're, you know, nearly a trillion dollar industry. When you look at recreation and uh, product sales and so forth, you look at the employment. You know, think about the North Face and Patagonia and Columbia Sportswear. Obviously, Hydroflask is part of that Yeti. We don't have mm-hmm. brands. We employ a lot of people. We pay good wages mm-hmm. you know, for 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 our employees. And so, showing up and just to say, hey, you know, we are an industry. We are an economic force. There are certain things that benefit our industry, like access to public lands, public lands that are maintained and are, are safe and so forth. Uh, and we think that's good for society, you know. Um, and some of it times it's reusable. Sometimes it's around health benefits. Mm-hmm. So if you're outside, you're active, what's likely to happen? Less stress, less health care related issues. You look at kind of the cost of health care and, and some of the crisis that, that's brewing there. Interesting. Um, so yeah, you feel pretty good about you know, advocating, lobbying is such a bad word, isn't it? But advocating for our industry in a way that tends to get a lot of bipartisan support. Mm-hmm. Um, so as it should. As it should, yeah. yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're on the far right, you, maybe you grew up in the outdoors hunting mm-hmm. uh, with your family on, on public land. So it's like, okay, that's your birthright. I'm sure you don't like to see plastic water bottles in the middle of the woods yeah. or so in a lake that you're fishing on or a river. Yeah, so it's kind of a nice calm denominator that's mm-hmm. more back to just what does it mean to be an American? And uh, we, we tie into that, so that's good. So a little bit of that, and uh, but we see it around the around the world. I think we see re- legislation in the UK that's starting to get towards, hey, let's ban some of this mm-hmm. stuff. Let's wake up and think about the the environment and what we're doing to it. Um, switching gears a little bit, what book have you gifted to the most people? I I got it first as a gift myself, and then I gifted it quite a bit. Uh, and it's funny how people receive these gifts, but it's the five dysfunctions of a team. The Patrick ah, Lencioni. yes, what a classic! Yeah, it is a good. I remember one. getting it. Good story in it too. I like oh, the, yeah, the fable. Yeah, the format. fable is good. Such a yeah. quick read. Mm-hmm. Read it over and over again. And I remember getting it at my last uh, job, and it sat on my desk collecting dust until I you know, ended up with Hydro Flask, and then just kind of you know on a, a lot of business travel, grab whatever sitting in the queue, mm-hmm. blown away, blown away, and. Um, 
it was I wasn't that far into my tenure as a CEO of Hydroflask, and I had to like pull this team together that I inherited. And I remember like one board meeting was fairly, you know, in, intense and a lot of like debate about what the priority should be for the company. Mm-hmm. You know, especially as I got in, it's mostly about opening closets and finding skeletons and all these kind of things in terms of just scale. Like you know, it was like survival stage company to okay, we're funded. How do we scale? So mm-hmm. like, what do we need to fix and adjust? And uh, I remember the board lead looked at me and he goes, well, Scott, what do you think is the most important thing or the, the biggest thing? I said, to see what this leadership team can do. So I said, it doesn't matter how grandiose our plans are, we're going to be limited by what this team can do mm-hmm. and how effective they can be. And then we can decide, do we supplement, do we, you know, what do we need to do? But if I can elevate this team, then that will be the gating item. That'll be that'll be the bottleneck. So did you do the two day retreat with them? We did, and All we right. brought in outside facilitators, and we did the the Lencioni methodology. Yeah. And over time, uh, you know, some of the leadership team scaled. Some are still there doing amazing work, but with did you, you have know, to get rid of over. some people during that? No, surprisingly, it was more about because in the story you got that I think Karen or whoever was just the just the yeah, worst. Yeah, there was some cancer and you had to you had to get rid of yeah. Yeah, yeah, not uh, we didn't have that. We had we had great people that worked hard, really wanted the company to be successful, wanted to grow, mm-hmm. but some just were at a level of their background and career that as the as the company scaled, their job scaled with it, and we ended up bringing people in above them. Okay. So it was more about that, and, and a lot of cases pretty much all the cases they were happy about that Mm -hmm. they were kind of like yeah i don't know how to do this stuff it's not my forte i just want to do this and that's why you know i joined the company just to do this well the rules now this you got to manage all these people you got to do uh it's not for me so okay easy here's a person that will do that that's what they like to do that's what they're good at you can do this okay Mm win-win so we've had a few of those examples but yeah really going through that and then it's it's always interesting when you receive a gift from your boss you know how people react to that so it's like, what are you making? What's what are you trying to tell me? It's like, no, no, we're just going to do this stuff. It's like about team. It's about all this. And I think over time, as we brought in outside consultants and facilitators, and we've done some of the uh, table groups, team assessments, right. and some of the discussions around that, they kind of get the point. You know, are we being honest with each other? It's like, can we call each other out on stuff? Yeah. We really trust each other. Um, and I love the work like Brene Brown's done recently around vulnerability and, and the shame mechanism and what it means to be you know daring and brave mm-hmm. as leaders and as, as humans right because they kind of go hand in hand and it's, it's a lot of the same methodologies can we be real with each other can we work our way up building off of that to to be accountable to each other and to really perform well as a team um so there's five dysfunctions and they go up like a, a triangle in yep. the book um and see if i get these all down trust conflict accountability um crap it's been a while since i did it but um do you remember one of those dysfunctions basically um being the hardest thing to overcome i think it's the first one trust just trust And, Mm -hmm. and what became harder as we hired really strong and seasoned executives that had built brands is uh they were sometimes the hardest. They were the most rigid in mm-hmm. some of the, the 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 methodology around it's okay to be wrong. You know, it's okay to maybe say, we had that work for that brand eight years ago and the world's changed. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's okay to be curious and not have to have all the answers all the time for right. everybody. And uh, it was such a contrast from, you know, again, I came from outside the industry, so no one expected me to have all the answers. Mm-hmm. How, how liberating is that? Probably was never as effective as a leader yeah. until I had that kind of pass. Because I in tech, I had to have the answers. And so I'm sure I went around obnoxiously pretending like I did have all the answers. I was probably not as good a leader as a result. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, coaching and developing a leadership team to say it's okay. You know, and then as we've learned, it's it's the stronger the leaders are, well, probably the stronger, the more credible they are, they're probably more um, uh, stubborn they might be, and so forth. The harder it is to turn them into a team. Mm-hmm. So it could be so exhausting, and, yeah, and so uh, you know, powerful when it when that happens. What do you do with trust? Like, how do you? Uh, what's your philosophy on how to give trust? or take it away or whatever, you know, some people are like, Oh, you, 
I, I give trust right away and then they lose it. How do you look at it? Yeah, I think I'm naturally trusting, you know, and so the key up front is make sure you hire the right people. So the competence. Hard key to and have. The, and the really, there's, there's good, you know, there's a person out there named Barry Deutsch that has a methodology in hiring. He's got a book called You're Not the Person I Hired. Because you, you hire off likability. I would like to read it's that a book. a really good book. <laughs> yeah, you're not the person I hired. Barry Deutsch. Okay. And because uh, it, it gets into like, well, we have a lot of stuff in common. That really be a great person to go drink beers with. And oh, what a, so, this is so awesome. We're going to hire this person. Then they can't do the job. Mm -hmm. But you hire off likability. You didn't really dive into the qualifications. You know, what are the competencies? What needs to happen? What does success look like? Prove to me you've done this before. Mm -hmm. And so there's really great things around that. So if you, if you get to that... Uh, and you get to the values piece, you screen for that as well. Then there's a good chance that the person, you know, is gonna is gonna rise up. And then it's a matter of okay, if they don't, you know, back to the failure conversation. Okay, they try, they did the best. You kind of assess what happened. It's like oh, you know, it's learning moment type of thing. How do you how do you react? How do you behave? So that's that. I think the other piece with trust is, um, you know, people never know. They come in, it's like, well, okay, I work for Bud. I, he seems trusting. Mm -hmm. I'm going to wait for him to you know, do the things. So leaders always have to go first on the vulnerability. So when we've done our offsites, we've had the com tough conversations around, okay, you know, hey, Tom, here's what we really value about you, and here's what would make you more effective if you address this stuff. This stuff mm -hmm. really gets a team dynamic and brings us down. So the leader goes first. You know, says, okay, everyone go around the horn. And we had a facilitator at the time. who just said, okay, here's one ground rule, and it's called – Practice honesty without brutality. You don't need to get dramatic to make the point. Practice you know, honesty, without, honesty brutality. without brutality. You're okay. giving tough feedback to someone. It may have upset you several times, and you finally work up the nerve, and now is a safe forum for this feedback. Do not lop the guy's head off with the mm -hmm. feedback. You know, can you, can you uh, be honest without being brutal? And that was helpful. I, mean, I don't think it we would have been brutal. I mean, we're a team, right? So, But there's a lot of stuff that surfaced where people are like, ah, you're a really great leader in these cases. But then you all undo at these moments you know, once or twice a year when you just lose your patience with me or whatever, the way that you do that. Okay, good to know. Good feedback. We all have blind spots that, that are just good to hear. Yeah. So for trust, it's always like leader goes first, which is very much the lens you only, mm -hmm. you know, approach and model. And then really nurturing that in, in other, other people too. Um. How often do you find yourself vulnerable with your team? This is the best part about having a team that's been in place for, you know, the minimum it's over three years now. And, and gosh, it's six, three to six years. And we've mm. gone through a lot together. And we all, it's like, remind them, I'm like, you guys know my weaknesses. You know, you know what I'm good at. You know what I'm not good at. Yeah. Uh, we all know what we're all good at and we're not good at. We don't have to fake it anymore. You know, sure. We don't have to try to impress each other anymore. We're, we're past that. Yeah. Um, what do you say to people that aren't past that? People or, that are afraid to show that vulnerability. How, it's funny, yeah. Then you just call them on it, you know. Right. So when everything's going great, we don't have to be past it. We can just smile and say, "Look how good." But we there's are. no one to call them on it because they're the owner of a company, right? And they're uh, listening. It who it is. Is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, there was those moments. And we, we, I think this is back to. I have a philosophy that is, you know, the world's changing, and leaders have to adapt. Right. Can you say that again? The world is changing. Mm -hmm. And so even the definition of leadership is evolving right now. Yeah. So if you kind of just take what's been the classic view of leadership, maybe that was even contemporary. What's your view on it ago, currently? That it's uh, it's much more about creating a workplace that's fit for human life. You know, it's it's about where people choose to come to work, choose to be engaged, mm -hmm. feel seen and heard, and uh, you know can do their best work. And don't have to, you know, put on the armor, don't have to play the game, don't have to pass time and wait for, you know, the more inspiring place to be that you can actually be that. So it could be around things like diversity, equity, and inclusion. Okay. So how do we lead not through command, control, and fear, but more about open-mindedness, engagement, fairness? Um, the world's going that way. Mm -hmm. So how are we as leaders doing that? So in these situations, then that creates a different type of leadership model where, yeah, you, you need to be more transparent. You need to acknowledge where companies aren't doing well or where, as leaders, the leader should be asking, how, how is this not working? You know, how am I not showing up in a way that, that's working? If they don't, creating that kind of safe place and the tools to... Who to should they be that. asking? Like for the Leaders solo entrepreneurs out there, well, not solo, but they have like a small team or a bigger team. They don't have a board. Man, it's just 
you know, I'd say go off site in some of those kind of, here's what we're trying to do. What are the priorities? Make sure part of the time is around, okay, how should we, what are, what are our rules of engagement? Mm-hmm. What's our team ethos? Spend some time doing that. And then spend time on, and it could be largely values based, but it might be a slight iteration off of that. And then make sure that time is spent on, are we doing or are we not? And, and you know, leader, if leader went first on this one, okay, where, where am I doing great work to, to honor these mm-hmm. and where can I improve and making sure that time is, and then go around the horn probably got everyone's probably got some critical feedback for their peers mm-hmm. they may not even be aware of the stuff that's going to come their, their way but no, if it's, if a lot it's of really times they around a, a gift to each other because we all got the blind spots mm-hmm. you know and we accept each other we're the team we're gonna make this thing happen then okay but you're really amazing at this and this part Wow, you just be mindful of it. Oh, okay, yeah, I've, I had that in my last job too. Yeah, I kind of lose sight of that. Thanks for the feedback. Because the intention is I'm trying to make you feel little. It's more of trying to help you become more effective. And Abs- then give me absolutely. that back. What absolutely. am I doing that's that's not working? And it's like, oh, that's what I'm working on too. Okay, guys, I, I commit to work on that. Give me that feedback when I'm not doing it. It's just sometimes it's, it's not top of mind. Mm-hmm. So The that's, problem that's is... Uh, a lot of people, and I, I used to do this myself, I've just started to realize I was doing it, so I was able to, st- I don't know if I completely stopped, but when you get that feedback, a lot of brains could go towards, well, I'm doing that because of this, this, and that, and I'm justified because of it, and you're wrong. Yeah, I know. Isn't it funny how it's uh, ego. humans, yeah, the shame and like, oh, I'm not good enough and all the things it triggers. Mm-hmm. And it's unfortunate. And you let people just sit with that. And uh, hopefully they come around because I don't know. I told, told one of my direct reports recently, like, I, I'm assuming you want to grow as a leader because there's nothing like someone helping you grow against your will. <laughs> you know, that's just, that's just why are you? So we had enough with, you know, parents and uh, so I'm assuming you want to grow as a leader is a lot better than you need to grow as a leader. Yeah, we all have to. Grow so it's not as what leaders. you say, but how you say it, right? Yeah, and, I, and this is one of my philosophies. We all have to, we all should grow as leaders absolutely the world's changing if our companies are evolving um, those are just good reasons if our competition is is exceptional then it, yeah nothing static around that Mm-mm. and so i think the best leaders are the ones that are you know self-aware development minded and curious uh and if you if you combine those two then you want to know how am i showing up you know am i showing up better and better as a leader Mm-hmm. And I don't always know. I don't always have the, the clarity of my impact on other people. No one really does. So that feedback becomes that gift. So baking that into your business and exactly for the reason you brought up, it may not happen overnight. It may take time for people like, okay, you call me on this stuff and I've got some insecurities around it. And, you know, it's my weakness and I didn't want people to see it. But now it's like we've gelled as a team. You know, it's my weakness. In fact, we complement that someone else kind of helps complement that with that's their strength this is my weakness but guess what that's so they have a weakness that i complement so everyone kind of feel that value i heard something uh, one of our our sister companies oxo oxo which mm-hmm. makes the kitchen products and you know great brand in manhattan view of the hudson river right above chelsea I and mean, just such a such a storied brand their head of engineering came out and said yeah there's all this stuff that's really painful as your company grows he goes and there's all those, that myth of every leader has to be perfect at everything he goes, that is just such a dumb... He's an engineer, right? So just to him, it's like, that's not logical. No. How could you write an app that's good at one thing and it's suddenly... Like a spreadsheet's good at PowerPoint. And yeah. good at, no, that doesn't make sense. Like, this is it. And, he, and it's like, gosh, you know, blew me away. I'm like, you're so right. It's like, we want leaders to like take your weakness, make it at least moderate, if not a strength. And then mm-hmm. you're basically tell them you want everyone to be perfect. It's just not right. So he, his mind is like, I can help this person with this. I will never do that. That person can do this. It's like, are we, are we starting to pull this larger team together and really use the strengths of, of what the team has to offer? Do we expect every person to address everything themselves? It's like, oh, another reminder about team and dynamics and, and how do we manage all this? Did you have a moment where you got some feedback going through the philosophy that you're explaining? Which, by the way, I love what you're saying. I try to live that myself. And I'm learning a lot just hearing you talk about this stuff and reminding myself of things I need to do. And then there's a few things that you said that I'm not doing at all that definitely needs to be done. So I appreciate it. <laughs> so just personally, I'm learning a lot from this. Um, has there been a time where this feedback of vulnerability hit you and it was really hard for you to take? Oh, yeah. you mind the sharing? Early, the early feedback. When it's like, we're going to do this methodology, let's go, leader goes first. I didn't like it. <laughs> I didn't like Why it. Not? It caused me, well, it started It started probably a year or two long journey 
into what is leadership mm-hmm. and who are my role models. And uh, was this in the early days of Hydro Flask? Early when you days say of Hydro Flask. Okay. Yeah, I mean, part of that, you, I didn't really think about this stuff at all. It's mm-hmm. more, you know, you ask me what, what I thought about leadership. I'd look up in an organization earlier in my career and, and be critical of it. Really quick. So I, to put in myself. to put in one thing, I want to come back to this, but when you said I didn't used to think about this at all, there's a lot of people out there that would be thinking, yeah, Scott, that's all fine and good, but you know, a company's here to make money. Yeah. We need to make money. Yeah. And what you're talking about doesn't equal sales dollars. Oh. What do you say to that? That it does. <laughs> okay, that's a great yeah, answer. That I it like does. That. Yeah. No, I mean, the, the, I think the studies are clear. The companies with the best cultures have the best, you know, engagement retention. They tend to uh, overachieve outperform the market mm-hmm. right and so like we would do denison surveys to measure culture before we were acquired by helen troy now there's a different methodology they use it's great so it, it's another piece of advice measure your, your culture mm-hmm. you know have the employees fill something out anonymously anonymously that that benchmarks you against uh peer group benchmarks you know it shows you where you're strong shows you where you're weak set goals around that over time you know we want to be really great in this this area we want to be really great in this area because it's important our, our culture is important to our company um so put, put those things in place. Yeah, earlier in my career, it was more because, you know, when people say leadership, you look at the CEO, you look at the VPs, if you're not that level, you know, but that, I think that's a cop out too because you can all lead. I think there's just you know, some chance of, for individual contributors to be leaders within their organization. Some of my best leaders here are not in roles of yes. management. Yes, yeah, and I think those are people that uh, have figured something good out. Yeah, my definition of it's kind of simple as it's changing because it changes all the time. But mine's a simply one uh, leader, somebody who looks out for the person to the left and the right of them. Yes, and uh, yeah. it just goes from there. And those below, if if they are again in management, for sure, I, I totally agree with that. I want to pull back though to when I cut, yeah, you because know, I really want to get into yeah, but that's not making me money. Okay, so you're talking about the early days of uh, doing these sort of vulnerability tests and how yes. that was hard for you. Yeah, no, brutal because, um, I, you know, I didn't expect the truth would hurt so bad. Mm-hmm. And for me, it was, oh, hey, Scott, you know, you're really easy going, you're fun, you laugh, oh, we have some good times together. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, you're just intense and your feedback is really brutal. And uh, your intense and your feedback is brutal. Uh, referencing not was it referencing? No, you went first, so this is referencing other. Yeah, these are people time. giving me feedback, right? And just saying like, you're so they're great telling you you're intense, for, but you, uh, you it all gets undone in those moments. So where, when I'm saying Scott, you're intense and brutal, and I'm one of your uh, direct reports. Was your mind? Where's your mind first going the first time you heard that? Is. Uh, question you know and it has such an impact that people want to back away from the business and like they're not stoked on the company anymore Mm -hmm. they're not stoked they're they're not sure they want to be there so i'm like okay (laughs) that isn't enlightened leadership that Mm -hmm. isn't great leadership you'd have to get but first you want to rationalize it just exactly what you said you don't say well that's what leadership you know steve jobs or "Ah, i work for ceos (laughs) it's it's all mercenary (laughs) kind of culture like you show up you you kick ass we all have a big payday or not and that's it. Sorry, you don't like it. Like, go away. And and so times have changed, though. So I had this vision, like, I'm becoming this enlightened leader. But my patterning and what I was doing was based off of the old model. And so it was kind of, people were holding The old model up. being the Steve Jobs yeah, model. Yeah, more of just, I'd like, hate that model. rip people down. Yeah. You know, Wear a turtleneck. Be a dick. <laughs> yeah, I didn't do that part. <laughs> but expect perfection at all times and let them have it when they don't. Or if you're frustrated, you yeah. know, then it's okay. Just take it out on your people. Uh, and then I, I hate that he made. I hate that, that he made that the standard with Apple's success. And I've heard it wasn't even as much as that was dramatized. That there was another side of him that didn't get as much publicity. But but still, I think that, you know self awareness and how we treat other people yeah. is such an important part. And so yeah, back to like we're here to make money. This is a business. You know, la la la. There's yeah, there's truth in that, but there's a shortcoming if that is an excuse for us to show up and just be jerks to each other. Mm-hmm. Because in today's world. People don't sit there and go, I'm going to go to this company for 10 years to grow, and I'll put up with a ton of like crap from everybody, and I'll hate it, but it's part of my career path. I, I think the younger generation is more enlightened, and they come no. in and say, this place is not for me. I'm out of here. I'm glad you call them enlightened and not entitled. Well, why, why would we sign up for hardship? You know, the part uh, hey, it's just hey, the hey, methodology. I, I really appreciate that because most of the time we're, we're called well, they're also the ones saying, like, what people. are we doing to our planet, and we should get rid of bottles. Yeah. So there's hope, right, mm-hmm. with the next generation. 
So that feedback was tough because I had this vision, like I'm an enlightened leader. Look, I'm giving out the five dysfunctions. Look, we're doing this offsite. Look, we're talking about vulnerability. What a great enlightened leader. And then the feedback <laughs> comes back like, you're the problem, mister. And it's like, what? And even my assistant who at the time, oh, God. She was there? No, no, but but I'd have a separate conversation in, in the performance review and annual, like help me with 360 feedback. She's like, same feedback. Like, man, you know, 90% of the time, you're a great boss to work for. It's so fun, engaged, you know, all this stuff. But that 10%, man, it, it just undoes that and then some. And so you have to deal with that. You have to say, okay, this is like a, this is a gift. It's tough medicine. So at first, it sounds like you were kind of going through the denial stage. Yes. And then, Anger. yeah. You brought it upon yourself. <laughs> yeah. you, know, like, yeah. you, you need this. Like, you need tough love. But now it seems that. Uh, well, you tell me. So that you then grow from that? Yeah, I mean, you have to really be honest with it. And that's what you hope when you give that similar feedback to someone on your team. And mm-hmm. you can see they've chewed on a lot. They've thought about it. They come back. They have a follow-up conversation. Like, that's usually where the good conversation happens. The initial reaction can be, which sometimes you might ask, are you in a position where you can take some feedback? Mm-hmm. And they say no. Then it's like, that's not the time to give it to them because you know you're going to get that reaction. So. Uh, if it's like, yeah, yeah, I'm really curious, you know, then there's a way that you can give feedback. But for me, it was that digestion period, come back and have a conversation or begin to learn. Like, how do leaders do this? Like, we get stressed. We feel f- like we're failing. Mm-hmm. We get really disappointed in our people. Mm-hmm. OK, well, what do our values say? OK, well, how do we manage, you know, our moods? How do we manage ourselves as leaders? If the patterning in the past is, you know, the CEO would let you have it and you're walking out and your gut's spilling out or whatever, uh, it's a choice to perpetuate that or not. So, you know, how do leaders that don't perpetuate that show up? How do they manage that? How do they manage themselves? How do they manage their emotions? And that's back to this, like, learning, discovery, growth. You know, the template of leadership as, okay, go to business school, learn about business, go execute, deliver to the shareholders, you know, deliver great returns. What about the people side? What about how we show up as leaders? That is becoming as important in my mind, if not more, than the rest of the basics. You know what's funny about that? What I was just thinking of when you were saying that is that's kind of like the problem that uh, medical school has when it comes to private uh, practitioners, right? So they learn how to become doctors and everything about that, but nothing about knowing how to run a business. And so a lot of them fail because of that. But... That's just a great analogy in the business school. Like you have that, but what about taking care of um, people? Which I don't care what business you run, it's ran by people. Yes, it's just that's how it's done, and it sells to people. And if it wasn't for people, it yeah. wouldn't exist. Yeah. So maybe you should look at oh, that aspect so, of it. It's so important. And back to that, you know, that softball game and that moment where that present point. Said, this is stuff they don't teach in business school, and this is so important. Mm-hmm. You know, this is stuff you learn the hard way if you're not if you're not tuned into that. And there's so many things around business that are like, okay, this is how we've done it for 10 years, but we know we need to change. Well, who's the biggest impediment to that change being accepted? It's the people, right? So as leaders, how do we work with people to lead them through change? How do we you know, grow as, as leaders ourselves, et cetera? It's just fascinating. So what did you do with that 10%? I had to change that 10%. Have you? I have, and it's been great. A hundred percent change, or is there? Is it so? There are times, and it's amazing how you can at least keep your mouth shut, but your facial expression (laughs) can give you away. Uh, But the people really appreciate knowing that I'm working on that. That I acknowledge that is my that is my weakness. Yeah, you're vulnerable to it, and that you're working on it. I've worked. Is it? It's funny. That's weird. I don't know how family dynamics, you know, factor into this stuff. I work for my uncle. Uh, who's a very successful entrepreneur. So he's like a Chinese Steve Jobs mm-hmm. in, uh, in Silicon Valley. You know, he built a company and sold it before he was 30 nice. in the semiconductor era. I mean, way, way back. And he's done a bunch of things since then. I worked for him for a period of time, and boy, he had a temper. He really did. And, and my mom did too. She's a little sister, and my grandfather did. And they were like, you know, successful Chinese entrepreneurs with a temper. Mm-hmm. And so, like, is this pattern? Is it in your blood? Like, is there like a little SIM card that's programmed to do that? Or is it something that you've seen? Uh, so it just caused you to revisit that and say, yeah. that that isn't awesome. Because if I'm on the receiving end, then I don't feel great. If my people tell me, my people who I want to be engaged and to rise up tell me that I'm doing things that create the opposite effect, mm-hmm. i got to own that. So I'm right. yeah, really, really working on it. And it leads to all sorts of things around, yeah, you know, when, when am I most likely to do that? Well, okay, I'm probably not sleeping well. I'm probably not getting out, mountain biking. I'm not up yeah. splitboarding. I'm not in the backcountry. Not eating well, 
not take care of myself, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm in a place. So it's like, okay, how do you do some of that? Meditation. How do you sure. just get your mind to slow down? How do you separate yourself from your emotions? How do you choose to uh, respond, not react, you know, build emotional intelligence? Easy to say, hard to do. You know, a lifelong journey. Yeah, that's for sure. Lifelong learning. Yes. I can relay. Um, you know, we kind of call that in my family, like the Torquem gene. So my, <laughs> yeah. my uh, yeah, my dad had it big time. He was a very successful businessman, but uh, he had a temper. Um, and uh, so did my grandpa. And now um, my brothers and sisters, they all have it. And they're all uh, pretty successful. My brother was a CMO at Burton, my sister's yeah. head of PR at Walmart, um, other brothers head of a big hospital administration out in Oklahoma and my sister's the head of drama over at RPA and um, and so it's driven us to success great things yeah sure yeah. it depends how you, but I started to realize that uh, what comes with it this whole um, this chip in me mm -hmm. so to speak what is that worth? Getting angry at people, getting upset at people, doing all that kind of stuff, making them feel like crap. Is that really worth it? Does that really grow your business? Does that really make you feel like a better person? And at the time, it was all justified. And then having that hard look in the mirror about um, a year and a half ago and determining that that wasn't the way. Um, and how about you just be nicer to people and, um, and really think about their interests and what they're thinking about and what what in the past when you got really upset and unloaded in anger on anybody or intensity, what good came from that? Yeah. And I kept on looking back at it, whether it was in business or personal. And I was just like, God, nothing, nothing good came from no. any of it. You always have to go back hat in hand with an apology. So right. you know that's not your best you know, and brightest moment. No. When you have to, you feel bad, you have to go back and apologize to somebody. So if you could avert that. And then just yeah, take care of yourself or find safe places to vent, but not at, you know at the at the person. And it's not to say you're excusing you know bad performance or, or violation of, of values or you know things that would should result in termination or writing up an employee. Mm -hmm. But again, it's just how do you handle it as an enlightened leader, or just how do you handle your own frustration or disappointment in a in an outcome? That's, yeah, that's the important thing. Yeah, I think it's, it's just like when you, when you can't get to that moment, because we were doing those exercises, the same ones you were talking about, uh, the five dysfunctions. And when that came around to me, um, I didn't have the maturity or the ego put down at the time when we first did it about three years ago to say you're right about that. And it was just justified as like, yeah, but that's because X, Y and Z and, yeah. and this is why I'm doing it. It's going to continue to happen was unfortunately how it ended. Yeah. And it wasn't until, uh, like I said, a year and a half ago when I had that moment where I was just like, it was a really deep moment. It was a dark, dark time in my life where I grew a bunch from it. Yeah. But God, the growing that came from that has been, in, it's the best thing that ever happened to me. And now I hear back from my team where they're thanking me a bunch for doing that for growing. I'm like, yeah. all right, well, that's great. Um, I, that's why I ask those kind of questions because I just remember being that person and I know there's other business owners out there like that. They feel completely justified or leaders or managers. They're completely justified in their anger and their temper and things like and yeah. of that nature. Well, you think about it back to the, like the five dysfunctions. So they're, they're coming back to me a bit better now, but, uh, you know, trust and then conflict mm -hmm. right? then commitment. So that conflict piece, sometimes if there isn't that conflict, it builds up, it builds up, builds up. When does it come out? The worst possible time when you're just tired, cranky, whatever, stressed, and it's pent up mm -hmm. and it's delivered like you know with a weapons grade payload that, sure. that far exceeds that one moment that, you know, that was justified because it's all built up. So I think it's back to that creating that type of team environment where that stuff can get surfaced, discussed, um, and then the accountability above that means maybe it's not always the leader's job to have accountability in the leadership team. Maybe a you know direct report calls aside a direct report and says, "Hey, I, I don't think this behavior is helping our team." It doesn't all have to flow through the leader. The team can view itself as accountable to itself too. So, those are things we continue to try to build. You know, hydro flask and can keep that kind of healthy balance. When people pent up and hold up, then the stuff that comes out of each other is usually not good. So, uh, how do you create that safe environment for it to come out in small bits and pieces that that's all around, not you know, uh, politicking and, mm -hmm. and people trying to put each other down, but really that intention, hey, we're trying to be a great leadership team. 
And uh, here's what I'm noticing. What, what am I doing that I can do better? Because I got my blind spots too. And if that's healthy and it keeps going, that's part of it. And then take care of yourself is, is the other piece. Um, last question. So if you had a billboard for the world to see, what would it say? Not business related. Can't say go buy a hydroflask. Yeah, shoot. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be the footnote. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> brought to you by. Yeah. I, I'd say get out and see the world. And I, I, you know, it's so funny. You grow up in uh, growing up wherever you grow up, and you got a view of the world. And then you you watch the news and you got a view of what the rest of the world's like. And then you go travel. And then what happens invariably is you meet people from other places, mm-hmm. and it's just so amazing how. Being human is such a common thing. Like we have, we have way more in common as people all around the world, you know, just trying to do what we're trying to do than you would ever think by you know, all the things that are happening in the world, all the conflict, all mm-hmm. the, you know, vilifying and all the, you know, polarization that's happening. It's like us and them, us and them. Everything is about us and them. Our tribe versus that tribe. We're all at war in every different kind of way we possibly can be. Then you go spend time with all these people around the world and it's like, Wow, there's just good people. Oh, there's certainly bad people in the world, but the majority of people are really good people. And you mm-hmm. get to respect other cultures. You get to understand other people and 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 their traditions and their beliefs. And you know, whether you agree with it or have to, you don't have to adopt it. But you know, I, I think if everyone did that mandatory service, that the whole world had to go travel to different places and meet people and, and build bonds and friendships, man, the world would be a better place. We yep. wouldn't have so much focus on the things that we're we're saying. You know, and you can isolate the bad actors. I mean, bad actors not representative of their entire, mm-hmm. you know, country, race, religion, whatever. Well, the when you go out and travel the world, the people that end up meeting you as well learn that uh, America is not all evil. Hopefully. I've yeah. been with people that it's like, <laughs> oh, this is how we get the reputation. You know, a couple of beers in, they're so obnoxious. Like, yeah. dude, like, you know, really? This yeah. is going to set our relationship back with yeah. this country a thousand years. Yeah, you got, you know, we don't think of ourselves as spokespeople for our, our, our country, but it'd probably be healthy if we did. You know, quit, quit abusing people or just how we show up, too. Be more, mm-hmm. more thoughtful. Yeah. yeah, be more like Canada. Be nicer to people. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, Sky, appreciate it, man. Boy, pleasure. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Cool.